Hi, everybody. Welcome to If Data Could Talk. My name's Andy Cockgreave, your host. And today we're talking about this Atlas of the Invisible by James Cheshire, who is Professor of Geographic Information and Cartography at UCL, and Oliver Uberti, who is a designer who's worked on this and the other two books and used to be a designer at the National Geographic. Oliver, James, welcome to the show. Uh, James, I'll come to you first. Can you briefly tell me what is the Atlas of the Invisible and particularly what is invisible about it? Hi, Andy. It's uh, about the way that uh, so much data has been collected about us uh, on any given day, at any given moment in time. The data gets collected, it gets stored, it gets um, hidden from us in many ways because it's up in the cloud or in databases. And so um, we thought that one of the great ways of visualizing this data is in some kind of atlas through maps and graphics. And so using the kind of the skills that we have, we thought we'd dive into those databases, uh, pull out the data and create our own uh, maps and visuals. And so there's not a particular narrative or single story in the book, um, but it is about how data can change perspectives and people's ideas about how we see the world, but also how we see ourselves. So. We've got topics in there about global air travel, about historic shipping routes, about even our DNA. So there's a wide range of uh, subjects that come under the banner of, you know, invisible data that's kind of been hidden from us. Yeah, that's great. And it, honestly, it's, it's, it's been an amazing read. Uh, it's opened my eyes to things I didn't know much about. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited to be digging in a little bit uh, with you both today. So um, early reviews have been uh, great. And Andrea Wolf uh, described the book as somewhat a truly Humboldtian. Um, now, some of the data and history nerds amongst our audience might know what that means. But James, why was Andrea describing it thus? And, the, and is that a pleasing outcome for the as a review? Yeah, I mean, we were amazed to see um, her describe the book in that way, because she wrote the best biography of Humboldt called The Invention of Nature. And so if anyone is qualified to make that claim, it's her. And we were really relieved and thrilled because um, we talk a lot about Humboldt in the introduction to the book and how he was one of the true pioneers of kind of thinking of the world as a single massive entity with all these interconnected parts. And so he went about collecting as much data as he could back then. It was through letters and it was, you know, stored in physical filing systems. But he collected this data. He kind of uh, thought about it. And then he, you know, created these enormous uh, tomes, one's called Cosmos, which talks about all his connections uh, and, and the, the, the ideas he's got about the, the Earth. But crucially uh, for the data of his community, Humboldt, teamed up with a cartographer uh, named Heinrich Berghaus because he knew that the data he'd collected, you know, was too much, too complex just to be written out in full or in a single table. Maps and graphics were going to be key to communicating some of his ideas. And that was really, for us, one of the sort of the starting point um, uh, for the, the atlas that we created, you know, in terms of our inspiration, in terms of the ethos, um, and in terms of what we were trying to emulate, I think, um, in the way that we were using contemporary data to tell uh, complex stories. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, Oliver, I mean, do you have any comments on that collaboration aspect as well? You know, you know what, what were the sort of the skills that you both brought to the, to the project? Yeah, I mean, since James and I first worked together uh, on a, when I was at National Geographic and I came across his PhD research on surnames and I came up with this idea to do a map of the most popular surnames in the United States. Um, it's been the same relationship of like brilliant academic who's got an incredible handle on huge data sets that no one ever knew existed. He knows how to wrangle them. He knows how to uh, plot them in amazing ways. And um, I come in thinking about the visuals of like, okay, here's how we could color it here's often how we could size it here's how we could lay it out in the spread and what's made what's worked so well is that we've always worked you know as equals you know one-to-one -one. and uh it's not like i'm just doing the, the window dressing at the end of the process like from the beginning we're kicking mm -hmm. ideas around one-to-one -one. 
we'll do an initial ex export. I'll see how it looks on the, the page when you've got a gutter, the book running right down the middle and you gotta make your map work on the two opposite pages. And so the entire idea is the collaboration. You know, what do you see in the book is a collaboration from the first idea you know, to the published piece. Yeah, and I, I, that, that echoes so much of what we've seen in almost all our episodes of If Data Could Talk is this marriage of technical or the science and the art and, and how <clears throat> you cannot have one without the other. And you absolutely, they, they are part of the process from the start to the end as well. So it's great. Um, now, there's, you talk about Humboldt, uh, you talk about Du Bois as well, uh, another pioneer in data visualization. There's a great, you, you pull a quote of his uh, in, in, the, in that chapter about saying how maps themselves won't write wrongs. It's about driving to action. And I think, you know, that, that, that goes down to the purpose of the book, but I guess further to the purpose of working with data. I mean, it's, James, what, how does the power of data and graphics maybe drive people to, people to action? And how did it influence uh, any of the visuals uh, in, in the book? Well, I think, you know, there's uh, uh, an inherent power in, in visualizing complex things uh, for people. Um, and I think the great power comes from uh, those who are creating the visualizations, investing the time and the effort in making them relatable, making them understandable and, and taking something that could be quite complex, but conveying it in a way that, you know, connects with people. And I think as soon as you've made that connection, it then uh, inspires action because someone might mm -hmm. understand a topic they don't understand, you know, they may previously have thought too complicated or seen something from a slightly different um, perspective. And so, you know, the work of data visualization, you know, uh, is, is to get something to the point where you can use it for an argument. And I think, you know, some of the work that Du Bois was doing uh, alongside um, uh, early pioneers um, of the civil rights movement was to, to, to make the use of data and graphics to almost um, tell the stories that were being deliberately hidden. And that's another theme coming back to this idea of invisible. You know, there's stuff in the book that we reveal that was deliberately hidden from, from view. And I think that that was the brilliance of uh, Du Bois. He saw that you know, to, to use graphics in, in, in the way that were effectively being used against people like him, you know, to communicate myths about, um, you know, the sorts of work that he was doing, yeah. you know, it's kind of like being able to push back and say, well, I've got these visualizations and they tell a different story. Um, and so that's very much, you know, we see these things as almost like a starting point for action. And then it's up to our readers to, to take them and, and then and move them forward. I think that's great. And I, I love it. Come to, to you, I think, you know, what, what, what are the sort of the, the, the themes that a, a visualization has to do to drive people to action? And, you know, is there an example, perhaps the iceberg chart is an, an example about the way you, you think, what are the four things you think about in, in creating a map to create action? We got four steps uh, whenever James and I uh, are working on a graphic and they're topic, data, angle, form. And what that means really is if you've got a, if you've got a topic uh, that you're interested in, you'd love to do a, you know, a visual on uh, the first step after identifying that topic is to go see what data is out there, what's, what's available. And once we find that, we start sifting through all of it, looking for outliers, looking where, you know, data clusters, where the natural breaks are in the data. Is this uh, thinking about what type of story is emerging here? Is this a story about process where we need to reveal how something works? Is this a story about change over time? Is this a story about geography? Uh, is a spatial relationship really important here? Okay, well, then we got to start thinking about what map projection, you know, might be appropriate. And... Uh, that's all about the angle, right? And that's finding about how you uniquely are gonna approach this huge umbrella topic. And the angle is the difference, right? There's so many times when I see data visualizations that are just patterns. People jump right from topic to form all the way at the end. And it's all about, look what I made, look what I exported. And it's all about, in my opinion, them, the creator. It's not about 
the reader, the person who has to come and understand what you've made. And so James and I, in all our books, we're always trying to think about the reader and the story we want them to understand. The story, in some cases, where we want to inspire them to act. And that's by always thinking about the angle and then making sure you do the reporting, the research, putting the text notes in, doing all the color treatments to help the reader understand your primary takeaway, the angle, you, the story you want them to know. And once you got that identified, then you can think about the form that's most appropriate and that's mm. going to accentuate that story you want them to know. That is absolutely amazing. I mean, if, if you take, if you, listeners, if you take one thing away from this, that, that is a really good process idea. Can you tell me, uh, Oliver, maybe how it applies to uh, one of the visuals in the book? I, I think what the Flint water crisis uh, maps is one of your favorites. Um, you know, tell me about the, the story of that and perhaps how the Ford steps led to that one. Yeah, so I lived in Michigan uh, for a while and went to the University of Michigan and I was in Ann Arbor. Uh, I think I was back visiting and I was at a cafe, one of my favorite bookstores, Literati Bookstore, and I ran into um, some you know, old friends and who are researchers at the University of Michigan. And they were telling me that they were trying to help uh, address the Flint water crisis with debt. And, and my ears picked up and I was like, really, what, what, what are you guys doing? And so I, I got my topic here. Okay, what, what is the data that they're collecting? And they told me that they've been working with uh, officials in the city of Flint and trying to go through all the property records in the city offices, like the, about the age of homes, uh, the, the vet property value of homes are going back a hundred plus years. And many of these records are handwritten. They were on pieces of paper. Some of them were like damp and uh, disintegrating, but they managed to digitize all this data and put all these different variables into a model that was helping them predict across the entire city, which homes might be the ones most vulnerable to, you know, having lead and galvanized pipes underground invisible things you can't see. The only mm -hmm. way you can see them is if you want to go around and dig up uh, every home in the city or so people thought. Turns out the data can kind of give you a proxy of seeing underground by you know, hinting where uh, the most vulnerable areas would be. So they built out this model and we show uh, what their model saw in the book, uh, which you know, we show the areas of risk that their, their uh, model predicted. And then we show crucially a step-by-step -step of how things went. And uh, early on, uh, they were using uh, the model and they had like a 70% hit rate. Like it was working perfectly. But then there were a lot of outer lying areas in the city of Flint where residents, uh, you know, they didn't really trust that. They didn't, they wanted the peace of mind knowing that their home had been checked too. And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of political pressure in the city to canvas the entire city, go door to door and just basically check every home at enormous taxpayer expense. And as soon as they did that, the hit rate dropped from about 70% down to 15%. And after about a year of that and a ton of wasted money, they realized, you know, we got to trust the data. Yeah, that's great. And, the, and you know, you visualize that in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the book too, to really, uh, impactful piece of work um so yes yeah, so that's an example of like all right we, we had our data and then we realized that our angle was to show once we looked at you know the drop hit rate we knew that our angle was we had to show what happens when you don't trust that and what happens when you trust that and becomes yeah. this great case study in uh data for good and it becomes a message, you know, when we talk about inspiring people to act, we want to inspire mayors to act because infrastructure problems aren't unique to Flint. This is going to yeah. happen in, you know, aging infrastructure is going to happen in cities all over the world. And we want them to understand that if you want to save taxpayer money and do it the right way, uh, trust the data. So I'm just going to jump in and, and, and say that I think, um, you know, a couple of the things that Oliver's just mentioned there, the, the trust in data and kind of case studies for, for data, I think is something else that was at the back of our minds when we were creating the, the book. I mean, it's self-evident. I mean, the, the, the Flint is a great example of where, you know, it's self-evident that the data are telling you something and, you know, ignore it at your 
your peril. And we have other topics in the book that, that um, reflect that um, strong message. But then equally, you know, we try and uh, talk a bit more about some of the complexities around, you know, data can, it can be used to empower people, but also it can be used, um, you know, to uh, oppress people or, or make decisions on their behalf and, and so on. And I think helping, you know, or at least using data and visualization to help uh, walk readers through some of those challenges, say the use of mobile phone data, for example. Yeah. I think that that is something that, um, you know, we hope that people will take away from the book and think a bit more critically about the data, but also think a bit more about the potentials for, for that kind of stuff too. Uh, right. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, atlases and the definitions and how that relates to the, the world that many of the audience live in and the world of dashboards and data visualization. Um, so I guess, uh, James, tell me, you know, what, what, what is an atlas and, you know, how should, how should somebody in the field of data viz think about maps and how the processes has changed and, you know, where, where do they fit in the world of analysts? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I'm not sure I've ever looked up the, the definition of the word atlas. So it may, I may get it completely wrong, but I mean, I, I often think of a, an atlas. I, I should probably do that, shouldn't I, as a professor of cartography? But anyway, um, I, I would see an atlas as kind of a collection of maps and graphics. And, and um, you know, I think that there's, there's a difference... Um, you know, in, 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 you know, the way that we think about atlases today, I think has to be different to the way that we thought about them previously. And there's something of a coming full circle in, in that thinking. So, um, you know, during the Victorian era, sort of the 1830s, 40s, 50s, up until 19, early 1900s, um, you imagine the, the, the amount of innovation that was happening then, the world was changing dramatically. There was a lot of industrialization. People were becoming more urban, you know, big changes in the world uh, and, or at least our understanding of the world. And so um, people like Berghaus and he's a, he had an adopted son called Peterman and people might've heard of Bartholomew and Johnston. There's loads and loads and loads of these kind of names associated with these atlases. They said, right, we need to um, we need to communicate these great things that we now know. And so we're going to put them in these atlases. And so an atlas was often a combination of both, um, you know, place names, roads, rivers, mountains, that kind of thing. But then there was quite a substantial bit of data analysis in there too, you know, showing trade flows and or, you know, exports, population characteristics, that kind of thing. Um, but over time, particularly sort of, at the early um, part of, you know, um, in the early 1900s and, and, and beyond, that data section seemed to get smaller and smaller and smaller. I think there's a combination of factors there. Um, you know, Michael Friendly talks about this move towards statistics and how, mm -hmm. you know, data and, or graphics is not a serious science. It's just, you know, pictures, nothing more. And, and actually what you need is like serious statistical analysis. I mean, they were horrendously expensive to create, you know, tons of effort tabulating all the data and everything. And so it was actually quite cost effective just to take, you know, the printing plates for a standard map of where your roads, rivers and mountains are, and then, you know, share them around and, and, and produce atlases that way. So um, some of the data stuff kind of declined, but now of course we're, we're in an era where electronic data is now the norm you know computing has become a mm -hmm. big thing and in fact the stuff that you see in a what you might think of as a traditional atlas that you may have had in the you know second half of um you know the last hundred years or so um is somewhat defunct and actually we can get it all on our phone and in fact the data about where the roads are is no longer the value in that is no longer in the map it's actually in the service that that offers you know yeah. if you've got navigation services or if you've got even self-driving cars or if you've got traffic you know, estimates yeah. exactly or yeah. how to how to navigate your taxi from one place to another you know that's what people pay for and so that's i see that as a way of kind of liberating atlases they don't have to think about that kind of or worry too much about that stuff anymore why not produce kind of printed books that contain uh 
some of the best examples of what maps can do, which is to explain a complex world. And so if we take that complexity that we see in the data we have, we can then lay that out on a page. We don't need to worry about screen size and resolution and you know, how people are consuming this, whether it's on a tiny screen or a wide angle. We can just tell a, a simple and compelling story from a complex data set that people can just you know, pan and zoom and look through themselves just by moving the page and enjoying the experience. So that's really our pitch here, I think, for Atlases. So if, if people say, well, you don't need an Atlas anymore, we've got Google Maps, you know, I agree that, you know, you don't need an Atlas to navigate uh, uh, physical features on the Earth's surface, but mm. um, Atlases, I think, are brilliant ways of navigating some of the complexity that we have uh, collected about ourselves through through the data that, that yeah, we um, I, generate every day. And I think, um, you know, my experience of reading the Atlas as well, there's, there's something about the tact, the tactility, tactileness. I'm, I'm going with tactility. That doesn't sound right. 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 But about, about, about the book, because one of my favorite charts or maps in here is about um, the ice, the speed of ice on Greenland, you know, beautiful map showing fairly scary speed of ice flows, but it's, actually something about the previous page, which is oriented differently and on a different scale, that makes the moment of seeing the Greenland map all that better. And I, th I think Oliver is a designer. I mean, I'm going to assume you like the physical nature and that perhaps even influenced the book. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll ask, drill down a little more. Like what do you remember what you felt when you turned that page? Like what, what was it? Well, I, I felt the change in scale and I felt the I, I felt the first page had primed me the, so the so prior to so on the greenland ice flow chart the prior one is a uh, zoom in on a uh a smaller scale mountain right uh, right where so it kind of primes me how to read the ice flow chart and then i turn the page and i get the drama of the entire greenland continent and the ice flow so it's a change of scale a bit of instruction a moment of a page turn and it's great. And, I got the same and, you, phys yeah. and you physically have to turn the book. Yeah, ab I yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to do it now because I was thinking when we record this, how am I going to show this it, it, on the thing? But maybe we'll do it. It's like, so here's the here's the first one. And then, so this is the, uh, what is it? This is in Alaska, right? The Juno Icefield, yeah. Juno Icefield. And then you turn it, so it's bigger. And I have to turn the book around as well. So there's a whole, you know, I don't get that on a web page. <laughs> so yeah. tell me tell me about that Oliver what, what, what's well, the intent I mean we hear Greenland in the news all the time we hear about the melting ice sheets and the and the uh, uh, the flow uh, the receding glaciers and it's almost become a character right like there's like mm -hmm. Greenland I feel like I have a parasocial relationship and because I hear about its name so many times and I I think we really wanted to treat Greenland that way to give it this like hero status and really let people see it. Um, and so why not like it's, it's big vertical format in a book design, you've got two options, you know, in a portrait, you could either have it on, you know, one single page or, you know, what if we tilted it on its side, spanned it, blew it up across two pages and made you physically turn the book to like, yeah this character and uh you know we we go through a lot of research to add labels to many of our graphics to adding base maps uh you know using some of the you know the, that roads rivers mountains all, all that sort of underlying base map data to ground the patterns we're trying to show um but in this case we we the only thing we did was we had a little um locator map of the United States with Greenland over top of it to give you a sense of scale, just how vast uh, this ice sheet is. But the map of Greenland itself, we just let it run unadorned um, because we, as you said, on the previous page, we already taught you how to read the map and what the colors mm -hmm. mean. Um, and so this time you can just turn it and just you know, uh, get that visual impact of man, uh, that's a lot of melting ice. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's a brilliant example also of our collaboration. So Oliver, Oliver, you know, we talk about how we work on equal footing. You know, those maps. It's not just a question of James generating a map of ice flows at a certain scale. 
and then Oliver zooming in or zooming out on the page or, or anything like that, you know, everything that we do has to be optimized for the page size that we've got, mm. you know, for the format that we're using. And so the scripting that I use to generate the flows and even the color choices that we discussed at length and the line thicknesses on the flows, all that stuff is optimized for one image. And then you turn the page and it has to be re-optimized for the second one. And it just wouldn't work if I had just gone off and done it all myself and then said to Oliver, right, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Try and create something that looks nice from this because it, it needed that kind of loop, that feedback to, to create the impact that, you know, um, yeah, well, you know, it's great that you you feel it when you when you. When yeah, you absolutely. It. So actually, let, let's um, I'm delighted that, you, you know, to find that I, I love about the craft of these things and, you know, as graphic communicators and working in data viz, yeah, line thickness, you know, I, I color palette must have been something you felt about, talked about ad infinitum on just about every uh, map. So just as a general question, you know, you know, you know, as I look through the book, I flick through it. It's just like, wow, you two came up with 85 different charts or however many there are in the book. And they all look so visually diverse. But uh, I don't know, is there, is there a foundation upon which you build the, a foundation from which you can build diversity of charts and how long did you spend talking about color in this book, <laughs> Oliver? Yeah, well, I mean, we worked on this book for four years, pretty much from proposal wow. to press. Yeah, and there was a lot of, um, I think, offline, off-screen mental work happening in that first you know, eighteen months or so, where I, you know, I'm going to the Los Angeles Public Library, James is going to the British Library, we're pouring over old maps, um, looking at color palettes, I'm wandering around just my daily life, like looking at the col colors around me, um, I'm looking at typography, I'm looking at you know, old maps, thinking about you know, what do we need in this book typographically? I wanna take it a little bit further than I've gone in, in our previous books. And um, I ended up building out a color palette based off of the colors around me in Los Angeles that are just such a mm -hmm. part of my life here. Um, and I found that the vibrancy and the range of color from the yellows to the turquoises, to the magentas, oranges and stuff uh, really lent themselves to one, a book that just explodes uh, when you open it with just a color and vibrancy and it's just really engaging, I thought. Um, but also it was just a very diverse palette that allowed me to pull uh, no matter what the story it was, um, to help just the colors do some of the visual storytelling and clue you in on what you should, what our topic is. So like we've got mm -hmm. a, a graphic about turbulence uh, and how climate change and, and, and changing uh, patterns in the jet stream, the atmosphere is you know, likely going to lead to uh, greater amounts of turbulence. So I tried a bunch of different palettes. I mean, the, 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 when we first exported the, the data out, it was, I think we were using like blue to red or something with yellow in between, just the default thing. And I realized like the colors you choose are part of the storytelling. They're part mm -hmm. of helping a reader engage with the information. So I thought if we're talking about turbulence that's going to make people grab their barf bags on an airplane, <laughs> what, if we, what if we used a pukey palette? And I, went from went from like gray to like the pukiest green possible. You know? I, yes, and I thought it too. So uh, that's <laughs> with with <laughs> carrot orange uh, accents as well. That was another. Thing. Oh, that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then so I, I used I used two little emoji, you know, like the puking emoji, and uh, yeah. and then a you know a gray happy face to you know work in the key to help drive that home. But yeah, it's just like. You know, color is not just something you tack on at the end. It can be part of the story from the get go. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. And and yeah, there's still a foundation, right? You know, so you talk about fight, yeah. uh, typography um, being a good baseline. Yeah, so absolutely. Like you know, when you're flipping through you know 200 some page book, um, it could be disorienting if you know the cognitive load. Every time you turn the page, you have to like. There's different fonts, there's different structures, things are moving all mm -hmm. over the place. Like the only thing we want you engaged with when uh, you turn the page is the story in the map or the chart, the data. We don't want you to be having to like figure out what page you're on and you know uh, 
Yeah, it could just be completely disorienting. So yeah. uh, when you're building an ensemble, when you're building like you know, 50 to, a collection of 50 to 100 graphics, um, it can be really liberating to have uh, a grid, uh, set style sheets, a typography, um, you know, all these things set in place that then allow you to just like really go wild with the graphics because you, people are always going to know these are all coming out of the same shot from the same authors. There's a color palette that unites you know, everything together. There's a typographic palette that unites everything together on every map. Every ocean is styled the same way. Um, and uh, yeah, I encourage, I mean, it's one of the harder Honestly, it's one of the harder parts of any one of these book projects, and it's yeah. why there's a real inertia that takes us a while to get started. In over four years, we produced very few maps in the first two years, and a lot of that is just, you know, I could have just applied the style sheets from the last book to this book, but I really feel like it needs to be bespoke to the project. And yeah. It takes me a while to find that visual voice um, that suits, you know. Yeah what that's these fantastic. graphics are going to say. And yeah. I'd say yeah. that's the, the final point to make is that um, you know, one graphic on its own, two graphics, a, a triptych of graphics, that is one uh, undertaking of it. You know, it's got its own role. You, know, you see really great uh, things like that in news and great magazines, but doing the entire book of them the graphics themselves take on a voice of their own, but sometimes we have to really be open and receptive to it. So over the course of four years, um, you know, we, we pitched this book with a different title and with a different angle. We thought at the time in 2016, when we pitched it, that we really want, want to do a full book, full world look at human migration. And as we started making tons of graphics and started paying attention to things, we realized that there was, that was a little limiting. There was so much more we could talk about with climate change and so much more um, that was emerging. And eventually we looked at the graphics we were making, the things that we were drawn to, the things that interest us. And we realized that these graphics were telling us something, that they, they added up to something bigger mm. than the sum of their individual parts. Yeah. And, and they spoke to us about this idea of an invisible world that can't be conveyed through text or photos alone. And from yeah. that, James and I looked at each other and we go, oh, this is, this is Atlas of the Invisible. All right, uh, James, tell me something a bit more about process. There are dozens of maps in the book. Uh, did you make dozens more? Did some of them get iterated multiple times? Uh, you know, is there anything you can shed any light on in that part of the process? Yeah, well, I think, um... We went at the end of the book uh, when it was completed. I went back to our big planning system. So actually, we we planned the book on GitHub and we used some of the project management tools on that. And there were as many graphics in the uh, kind of uh, cut, you know, yeah, on the cutting room floor column that we would never look at again as there were in the final finished product. Wow. And I think that is something that um, you know. Uh, people who are creating their own maps and graphics and I, I mean I see this all the time with my students which is you know they have the finished product in mind and they have the data set in mind and then you go on this journey and you may not make it and some people get incredibly frustrated because they feel like they're just not making the progress they want to make or the problem's too hard or the data's not good enough and whatever the idea has not come out the way they want and I think that's very much a normal part of the creative process for these kinds of books so mm -hmm. one example um was in the, the early stages of the book it hadn't quite found its shape and its voice yet but there was a we felt a lot of pressure to use data in such a way that it would push people's understanding of something it would add value and so we we got some flights data and i spent probably weeks in the end coming up with different angles on this flight data can we map it to satellite images of contrails can we look at the altitude of the planes can we crunch the data this way that way can we take extracts from it for particular countries and so on and so forth and it just became this mess of uh complex colors and confused ideas and in the end we just said right strip it all back let's just create an image that's black and white and see what it looks like mm -hmm. and then we said oh well, hang on this tells a strong story about air pollution, about 
carbon on the in the atmosphere let's just make the lines look like carbon they've been drawn in a kind of a carbon pencil and give it a nice sort of paper texture underneath and that's it you know that image stands alone as a powerful message about how crowded our skies have become you don't need any more than that but that was probably in terms of processing time in terms of the kind of technical aspects of creating the visualization that was probably like one morning in <laughs> to what you know I, came, I was at that point and then I spent two weeks doing something else and then yeah. we came back to that point and so you know um, I think it's just you know I like to remind people that you know we're not just bashing through these things like one by one by one by one and it's all successful actually you know we still have quite a high failure rate and that's an important part of the process and it means that what's left is is so much better uh, for yeah. it. Yeah, and so sometimes on a graphic, you know, we're we're seeking to add more complexity because the story is, is got lots of complexity and nuance. But on this one, as James you know alluded to, when we step back and ask ourselves why, you know, why are we coloring these flights by altitude and just adding unnecessary complexity? Like, what is the story we're trying to tell? And once we like reminded ourselves of the story we're trying to tell, then you can strip out all that extraneous, you know, color information that just adds cognitive load. Brilliant. And Oliver, tell me, um, you know, what, what's the highest compliment you, somebody can tell you about what what the book makes them feel? You know, what, what what's your intent with this book? I've been hearing from a lot of different readers who um, been telling me that this book transports them back to their childhood and the wonder they felt paging through atlases and looking, pouring over, you know, the road atlas on a, on a trip with their family. And um, just that wonder of seeing the world anew. And that's probably the nicest compliment I can receive because in many ways, I mean, let's all just take a moment to like transport back to just mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago when Keyhole first came out, which eventually became Google Earth. And the wonder we all felt as adults, seeing the world anew for the first time, being able to spin it around and zoom in, you know, and the downside of that is this now ubiquitous and maps and satellite views and zooming in all over the plane, it kind of seems default. Of course, that's the way it's yeah. always been. And sometimes, you know, people think, you know, close family and friends, like think the maps I make can just be downloaded, like with a click of a button and put it in the book and you're done. And, you know, for, for our graphics to be able to reinstill that sense of wonder, I mean, that's what it's all about, man. The world yeah. is worth protecting. I yeah. It inspires people to care. That's fantastic. Uh, well, right, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish with one more question, and this is a hardball one for James. There's a section about map projections at the end, James. What's the best map projection for the globe? Oh Jesus, uh, you can't <laughs> uh, you can't ask me that. Um, well, there, I mean, there isn't one. I mean, that's the the, the, that's uh, true. the, the truthful answer. I mean, it depends. Yeah, but come on, at. come on. This and is I think, freaking cool. I think these yeah, are, but it, these are the end it's, papers, it's, and then. It, it, yeah, I think I think um, yeah, that is you know Sorry, being able James. to use no, it's fine. But being able to use them as a uh, as a device to show fresh perspectives, or like I'm a big like the Spillhouse projection is great if you're trying to show oceans because it just is brilliant at just uniting every you know you're trying to show that all these things are connected from one end of the earth to the other. You know, just unite it yeah. all in a single projection um and you know things like that are just the projections are a great example where you know modern mapping software web software uh web-based mapping software just hasn't been able to kind of uh, keep up with 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 that and so like the Mercator projection which is the projection that cart cartographers love to hate which is the one that you see on your standard kind of google map or any kind of web slippy web map you know it was great if you're navigating a ship across the ocean and it's great if you mm -hmm. need to make tiles for the earth that that uh, enable you to zoom in and zoom out but it's really 
terrible at storytelling a lot of the time. So yeah. being able to work in a printed book, work with more advanced kind of software in terms of the projection functionality and stuff just brings this stuff alive. And I think that's one of the things that I've loved most about this book. And again, that harks back to some of the pioneering uh, uh, atlases that, you know, of um, yesteryear, all these atlases, if you buy, if you, if you pick up an atlas e of eBay, that was published, I don't know, between 1850 and 1950, there would be a selection on map projections or the cartographer would be showing off about some new projection they're using. And I think that that's something, you know, I've really delighted in yeah. um, playing around with for, for the book. And hopefully, you know, there's some stuff in there that, that, that readers won't have seen before. We, we put in uh, little notes next to each projection to explain why we use them and which graphics, mm -hmm. you know, you can flip back the page numbers and see, you know, what stories yeah. we um, uh, use them for, because that's ultimately the topic data angle form thing applies to map projections as well. It's the form choice that you make after you've decided the story that you want. To yeah. That's fantastic. I, I mean, I, I did really know that asking a professor of cartographer, a cartography and a designer, that is never going to be a softball question. And it's effortless in data visualization, right? Every chart is a compromise. It's, it's whack-a-mole. You, you, you push one problem down and you create another one and you have to make those choices. So look, I think let, let's wrap up. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm super grateful for your time. And hopefully everybody watching is now desperate to go find out more. So uh, James, how can we find out more about the book and about the two of you? Well, um, Atlas of the Invisible has its own website, atlasoftheinvisible.com. And we're on uh, Twitter as Atlas Invisible. So if people want to check out uh, what's happening with the book, so we'll be posting events there, any kind of reviews, media, where to buy it. That's probably the first place um, I'd go. And then um, Oliver and I are both on Twitter, I'm at Spatial Analysis, and Oliver, you are at Oliver Uberti, is that right, on Twitter? Mm -hmm. And Instagram, what are you on Instagram? Same, Same thing. At Oliver Uberti, so uh, check those out. Right, okay, so atlasoftheinvisible.com, uh, go check it out, I highly recommend it. And with that, uh, James, Oliver, thanks so much for your time again. Uh, thank you for everybody who's been watching. Tell us what you think, you know, what's your favorite projection? Clearly not an easy question to answer. Don't tug do at that thread, know. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we'll see you all again on If Data Can Talk. Take care. Goodbye.